Uh, my name is Sean T. Eveline. I am uh, producing, making a documentary film on the meaning of homeless, of, of the meaning of, of home, seen through uh, a story, uh, a year long journey of the story of uh, a homeless, uh, formerly homeless, coming off the streets into a, an innovative new village developed by uh, a Catholic uh, real estate uh developer and he's created this this uh teeming ecosystem uh to so that they can thrive with with, with the un understanding that you cannot s solve homelessness uh with housing alone but you need community very cool Karina? I'm Karina. I'm from my prayer corner. So I am working on launching a program that has home altars and experience packs for kids and their families to do to be able to experience God's love in their home and learn how to pray. So little daily initiatives that they do in their home to be able to make it a daily habit and have prayer become the number one part of their life. Well, thanks. Awesome. All right, everyone. So I think we'll get we'll get started. So we got 16 on the line right now. And I am really excited to uh, present you or introduce you guys to Anthony. So Anthony, if you look at his background, he's actually in Innovation Park. Uh, that's one of the offices that you guys will all be at um, in a few weeks. And I got to know Anthony actually through a few different directions. I think Jason introduced us and Ryan Krieger introduced us and a few, few other people. So there was a small world connection. But one of the reasons that they all did was Anthony's background. One of the things we'll talk about, I'll, I'll read the LinkedIn style intro in a second, but one of Anthony's background, the Anthony's background has a really nice combination of uh, equity investment and philanthropy and just very passionate and works with a group called the Altum Fund that is passionate about Catholic initiatives. So we're going to hear more about his experience and more about the, a little bit about the fund itself, uh, but also know that Anthony's going to be coming to Demo Day as well and so he's going to be able to offer a lot of experience and you guys will be able to, to meet him in person too and um with that let me give you the the formal intro the so he's the executive director of the altum fund and previously he worked at acton institute and he had several several roles at the philanthropy roundtable he supported the catholic church through his work mobilizing donors organizing events to expose the cause um, causes of the church and through his work with Catholic schools. Anthony holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy, business, and theology from Franciscan University of Steubenville, of which Micah, you are also, you get the shout out there. Okay. But uh, nice. Anthony, why don't I pass the mic to you? And as I mentioned this morning, I can be looking at the chat and I can help if anybody just needs to use chat for questions and stuff like that. So um, otherwise, I'll help people go on on mic and we'll do q a in a little bit more of a live format too yeah that sounds great thanks john uh right. good to meet you everybody uh been following um, we met, met a couple of you already um and been following kind of what you're doing um met uh jason uh and the osv guys i think i went to visit if you guys have never been by the way go to visit osv what a fascinating visit that is um but it, but uh huntington is only like uh, an hour and a half or two hours from here so i got to meet those guys back in february realized we had a lot in common and they started telling me about the innovation challenge so i started hearing about all of you um so very excited to have a have a good chat today um and to hopefully meet you at the, the pitch uh, the pitch day uh, next month excited about that i guess i don't really have to travel very far so i really don't have an excuse to not be there um but um so I'll fill in a couple of things. By the way, you, John mentioned I, I had three different degrees from Franciscan. By the way, I don't recommend that at all. Like three undergraduate degrees was, um, it was like super overachiever and I, I don't actually, it was a bad idea. Um, I liked what I studied, but it was, uh, it was way, um, I could, I should have spent my resources differently. But um, so my, a couple things about my background. So I, I grew up about an hour from here in Southwest Michigan. Um, my, uh, we just moved back here in October. We, we were in DC for a decade when I was at the philanthropy round table. Um, but the, the, the Altum fund is a, um, is a family foundation. Basically there's, it's probably 95% of my time is philanthropy. About 5% right now is, is on the, like the impact investing using equity with uh, investments that have some sort of social return 
as well as financial return. Um, so we've been spending, um, yeah, most of the time recently is, is philanthropy. But um, so the, the family I work for is in Chicago. It's, it's a family foundation. I'm, I'm a staff of one, uh, and I'm the I'm the first employee. So it's um, I'm very much kind of creating some structure, giving them um, you know some management so that they can kind of focus on the higher end um, stuff that they're interested in. I can manage the day to day, um, so they're not overwhelmed with it. Uh, we can get into more of some of those uh, some of those in a little bit. Um, so I've got, uh, my wife and I have six kiddos. We've got a full hockey team. Uh, we got to get jerseys made. That's our next, uh, our next step. Um, the oldest is 12, all the way down to our youngest one year old, just had his first birthday. Uh, we bought, uh, talk about difference in um, property values from, you know, from the DC area to Northern Indiana. We bought what used to be a horse farm. So now we've got 13 acres to let our kids roam. Um, and during coronavirus, we've been fully embracing the idea of child labor putting kids to work. Uh, they've been getting paid for it and they're excited and they're, uh, they have all sorts of stuff that they're excited to buy and they want to start businesses now. So they're getting the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial bug. My, um, my dad's also an entrepreneur. So it, it's, it's a little bit in the, in the blood. That's kind of what got me interested in a lot of these ideas and in philanthropy, to be honest, um, this idea of, of, of solving problems, of creating something new, um, creating value. I, I have a phrase in, in philanthropy that there's not a lack of money uh, to support projects. There's a lack of good ideas and good leaders who can implement. Um, and that's, and that kind of gets, gets down to this notion of philanthropy and some of the stuff I want to talk about. There's, you know, good, good ideas and, and actually people, I've seen a donor flock. They can't, you know, can't, um, fund stuff fast enough when they find stuff that's really amazing and really well thought through, planned, has an excellent leader behind it. Um, so it's, uh, that's kind of what, what it gets, I love, I love the problem solving side of, of philanthropy. You know, donors love solving problems. They love getting into, um, the issue, obviously issues they care about, those, those things matter. Um, but that's kind of the side I love. I love figuring out new ideas and new, new, uh, new ways to solve them and working with, with really great people uh, and looking forward to meet, meeting you guys. Um, so I, I have, uh, John and I talked this morning, so I, I, I've got a bunch of things I can cover. Um, don't hesitate to stop me if you have follow-up questions. Um, this is going to read a little bit like um, a laundry list. Um, just by its nature, this, some of these are just tidbits I've you know, gathered over, t over time. I'm going to focus on kind of you know, how, how funders see projects and investments, what they look for. Um, obviously not, not everything's the same and, and someone with my same professional background could, could highlight, you know, entirely different things. So this is just kind of my version of what, what I've experienced. Uh, there's, there's more to it than that. We're not going to cover everything. Um, but I kind of highlighted a few things and I can tell you, at least from our perspective, how we look at things. Um, a lot of this is, um, just to, to point out too, a lot of this is coming from my background at the Philanthropy Round. Roundtable was a net. It is a network of about 700 donors around the country. Um, that it's not a. And there's no specific religious affiliation. They were very uh, religion friendly, so there was a big contingent of, of LDS, uh, LDS donors, Mormon donors. There's a big contingent of Jewish donors, evangelicals. Um, so we, I got to know kind of all this. I, I was, I was kind of the, for a while the de facto Catholic guy. So whenever donors would come in, interested in Catholic stuff, I was always brought into those discussions. My day job was in K-12 education reform, and through that, I got to know a lot about um, Catholic schools. I did a lot of work on, on Catholic schools. I started a working group for donors who give to Catholic schools. I'm still part of that, um, looking for how we can co-fund things that are benefit when we come together instead of just funding stuff that are that on our own. Um, so this, a lot of these lessons are brought from just you know years of discussion with donors, how they think about things, what, you know, what interests them, how they, how they try to solve problems. And everybody's different. Uh, I guess that's one of the key things to know is that not, you know, no two donors are going to be the same um, and what they're interested in is not the same, how they approach it's not the same. A lot of times donors are going to approach things in a similar way to their, um, you know, to their professional background. And I, I think we're, we're an example. Here, Anthony, I'm going to yep. put you really quick. Um, yep. The audio sounds like it's coming in and out. I want to just do a check for everybody. Is that, is it similar issues for other people? So it sounds like it goes from like an audio level three to an audio level eight and kind of alternates. So we can still hear you. It's, it's possible my, uh, these earphones are a little old. Hold on, let me just put some, my, uh, my DJ headphones on. Okay. How about now? Very clear. All right. Um, so, so yeah, just a lot of things saying this is based on kind of my, a lot of stuff I learned at the round table um, and kind of discussions with funders, what they, 
found valuable. Uh, we put on a lot of events, you know, publications. Um, I'd say the biggest thing we did was conversations about what they're trying to achieve and focused on, um, uh, we've made a lot of introductions. You know, a lot of people don't realize that donors don't have an easy way to meet their peers in other parts of the country. Um, so we were, I was a facilitator of that. So um, obviously stay in touch with a lot of those, uh, a lot of those donors now as well and give it, you know, kind of advice to nonprofits and, and startups that are looking for support. Um, let me get into a few things. So, <clears throat> um, so the Alton Fund, like I mentioned, is, is a family foundation. I met the family about eight years ago um, through the round table. Um, they have a private equity background. So a lot of the way that they approach giving is, uh, is, is, is as, as, like an equity investor would, uh, looking for leaders. Um, I'll get into some of those details in a second. But um, uh, they're based in Chicago. Um, usually I don't lead with who they are. Eventually, you know, if we start talking about um, get to know people and like their ideas, you know, we'll introduce them to the family at some point. Um, they do have a couple of investments here at Notre Dame. So there is a, a reason for me uh, to be located here. Uh, and obviously it's nice to be in the idea center. It's like a little Silicon Valley in the, in the middle of the Midwest. Um, and I, I won't, I won't go into the kind of the, there's some mechanics of how we give that's, it's a little different than, than you might ex, ex, your experience with others, but I'll, I'll go into that later if, if we need to. Um, and just to give you a, a, a sense of what, what sort of stuff we're doing. One is um, we're giving, last year we gave almost about, almost a hundred grants. Um, and some of those, you know, we're all different kinds um, for, for different reasons. Um, but you know, the main focus is is, is Catholic is Catholic giving. Um, we were one of the first investors in Bishop Barron in um, the Catholicism series. That was before I was with the family, um, and also are, are you know, very active in Catholic charities in Chicago. Um, very involved with the tax credit scholarship program. If you know school choice policy uh, in Illinois, um, and have a number of you know ranging from startups to to existing programs. Um, very interested in, in Catholic culture, um, Catholic arts, you know, investing in truth, beauty, and goodness. Um, and a whole host of things. We can get into a few, a few more of those as we go. Um, so let me just go through a few things on uh, things to know about donors, how donors think. Um, so for, I mentioned, you know, they're all different. You're, you're going to find different ways of, of thinking, how the giving approach, what their calendar is, how, whether they want an application, et cetera. There's a lot of kind of mechanics that they're all different. Um, in general, one of the, the trends amongst donors that you're going to want to work with and investors you're going to want to work with is, is looking for donors who want, uh, they're going to have a problem solving mentality uh, to touch on earlier. So um, because of that, you know, they're, they're looking for, you know, issues they care about and people who understand a problem really well have articulated that and, and have come up with something that's legitimately going to solve that problem, really address it um, in kind of a, a clear and compelling way. Um, because of that, uh, you know, looking at kind of this, this problem solving mentality. Um, you know, these funders are also much more likely to get, get their hands dirty. Um, so this is, this is going to be more of a characteristic of, of funders who are, um, you know, who are still alive, right? So it's, it's, a, it's not a foundation that is a couple generations since the original funders. Usually it's, it's much more, there's a lot more process involved after that. Um, the, so these funders like getting their hands dirty. Uh, they want to be involved with the work. Oftentimes they'd want board seats or they want, you know, frequent, you know, not frequent updates, but, but, you know, uh, substantive updates um, and, and to be part of problem solving when there's a, a problem or an issue, they want to be know, let, let known um, and be, be, have a conversation and come up with ideas and, and, and possibly make connections and, and, you know, suggest other people to talk to that might have um, ideas or ways to help solve, solve something. So um, uh, donors in like, that, in those you know, cases want to be, uh, if there's a problem, they want to want to know soon. Um, and also want to want to be asked for advice. Um, a lot of these, you know, the, the family I work for, they, you know, the background is private equity. They have you know, a lot of business experience and, and management knowledge and, and can really, um, so see, see funders as more than just money, see them as, as an asset and their staffs for that matter, um, as, uh, as, as able to help and, and, and add value beyond uh, an investment of, you know, just, just financial, just a financial investment. Um, so I, let, let me go through a couple of things that, that we look for. Um, and the other thing I would say, actually, before I go to that, um, at the end of the day, the, when you're looking for investors, the thing that matters is relationships. Um, you know, we're never going to invest in someone we don't know, um, or don't have a relationship with, don't trust. Um, we're looking for uh, people we, we know, we, we like working with them, we're going to be spending time with them, uh, communicating a lot, on phone calls a lot, meeting them, hopefully, God willing, at some point, meeting again in person. Um, and you know, it needs to be someone that we, that we like, that we want to work with, that we think is, uh, is going to be good to work with, with others, other, other nonprofits, other donors. Um, and, and that's, so we take time to figure out who the, you know, 
talking to someone. We have a lot of, I kind of put my, in my email box, you know, there's people that are actually, we're going, we're in an application phase. And at, the, at that point, it's, it's someone who's made it pretty far and we really like them. And usually by that point, it's, it's deciding how much and, and it's usually not a yes or a no. It's a, like, do we, how are we going to structure it? You know, uh, over how much time, how much money, um, what are we going to ask for in return? Those kind of things. Um, but I have a huge, probably the, the bigger one is just conversations. Like people are just talking to um, at what point, you know, we're, we're hearing about them, learning about them. Do we want to go further? We, we, we would usually then invite someone to say, Hey, let's, let's, let's do Let's dive in a little bit more. Let's look at your, your plan. Let's look at your budget. Let's try to understand that better. Um, but there's a lot of people that just kind of stay in the, in the conversation phase. And during that phase, that's when we're looking at some of these other things. We're looking at leadership. We're looking at character. Um, we're seeing if, if the plan is compelling. If we think the, if their, their solution for the problem is likely to succeed, uh, those kind of things. Um, so, so some of the stuff we look for, and this is again, sorry, a little bit of a laundry list here. Uh, number one thing is leadership. Um, so that's, that's a way it's similar to, to like equity investing. Uh, at the end of every investment, there's a leader. Um, there's someone that we trust that we think is compelling and that they can solve this problem. They can, um, you know, write the, uh, write the ship, you know, um, you know, create or create an organization and really um, do what's, what's needed to, um, uh, to achieve their mission, right? They have this vision, they have uh, clear and compelling, um, articulation of, of what they're doing. Um, so it's, it's the same for, you know, as for-profit investments. Um, and the you know, other things we look at, right? How, how do they take feedback and suggestions? Is this something that they, you know, it's just kind of a necessary evil that they're looking for, for investors that they need, you know, funding for it, or do they really want a partner? Uh, we like working with someone who's, who's going to be, who, who would see us, see us as a partner and wants, wants to have kind of a give and take. Uh, relationship. Well, I mentioned we also look at, at character, um, specifically humility. Uh, I'm always looking at the issues of integrity. Um, are there any, any major red flags about how someone um, interacts or deals with, um, you know, if, if we suggest something, is that seen as a positive thing? Is that, um, are they, are they willing to say that some things aren't working? Um, also, and the other thing I was, I was talking to Edward yesterday, and, um, <laughs> he was good at pointing out that uh, we, we like candor. Um, you know, I want, to, I want to kind of plain speak about what's going well and what's not. Um, that's how we can be most helpful, by the way, is if something's not going well, we, could, we, we would want to be seen as a partner in helping to, to solve some of those challenges uh, and giving feedback on, on maybe how to approach it. Um, if uh, We're always a little bit concerned if we get nothing but rosy. Everything is rosy updates. Everything's going perfectly well. There's no problems whatsoever. Uh, nothing is ever going to be 100%, 100 successful all the time. Like we expect to get uh, some some reports on you know challenges and things are taking slower to to take up and uh, this you know issues with with people you know things don't don't happen exactly the way that you not, nothing is ever you know plan as soon as the plan is is written it's it's already outdated so we know that uh, we want to find someone who, um, uh, who who's who's able to navigate that that's that's kind of what we're looking for for someone who a leader who can really navigate those those thorny issues um, we also I mean to to that point too we're also looking for failure right uh, failure is okay. Um, some, some, I've, I've seen this with some grantees or pr prospective grantees and they are just afraid of saying that something didn't go well or they weren't totally successful. Actually, that's one of the things I, I love asking in job interviews is tell, tell me about the last time you failed at something and what did you do about it? Uh, Cause that actually tells a lot about someone's character. Um, so, so fa failing's okay. Things, things not going well are, are okay. We just, we have a, an equity investment right now at a, um, it's basically like a job placement program for, for opportunity youth in Chicago. And they had to totally pivot their, their entire mission because one of the assumptions they made early on was wrong. They expected that some of the, the other job training programs uh, for entrepreneurs um, and, and just people seeking, you know, just uh, general employment in Chicago, that, that, they, that they thought there was a lot of really good ones in the city. And it turns out there weren't. So they had to pivot and totally just create their own uh, job training program. Um, so but that's okay. I mean, I, it's, they have a great leader and they're figuring it out. And, and so we're okay with that. Um, it's going to take some extra resources, but they're going to get to where they need to be um, for their for their mission. So, um, I, I mentioned this a little bit. Another thing that we look for um, kind of problem articulation. Do you know the? Uh, do you have a really good understanding of the problem you're solving? Sometimes people come up with a solution before they know what the problem is, and that's that usually doesn't lead um, to long term success. Um, so, a, kind of a well developed understanding. What is the problem you're solving? Um, you know, just some people can be accused of kind of admiring the problem. They understand it so well. It's uh, they just all, all they do is kind of talk about it. So there needs to be a little bit of a balance. Um, but we, we want to know that you've really thought about it, understand it. Um, I was telling this to, to Edward yesterday. Um, I mean, you should, in your pitches too, there should be a, a certain, under, you know, be able to, to go far enough to, 
to explain what your what your problem is uh, that you're solving. And you should have some, hopefully some stats behind it, right? Most of the investors um, coming out of the business world are going to expect that. Uh, there'll be some stats. What is the, so for, so for Edward, just as an example, because we talked yesterday, um, you know, reaching the nuns, um, there's stats on that. L look at some of the Pew data, look at um, some of the other data. So there's, there's those, I, those are some stats that I would expect to be part of, part of any pitch. Um, I, I think we all know that the, the nuns are, are increasing, um, but I, I can't remember numbers off the top of my head. So it's, it's always good to have that as a, as, as a, as a background, as part of it. Um, uh, the other question is in terms of like problem articulation is, is so, okay, so there is a problem, you have an idea to solve it. Why are you the right person to solve it as opposed to someone else? There's a lot of ideas out there. I mean, how many ideas were submitted to, to the, uh, to this challenge? You know, lots of them, you guys kind of emerged as, as, um, the, some of the most compelling, um, but why, why you, you know, why, why, you know, that, solving X, X problem with, with Y approach, why, why are you the right one? Um, so it, it helps to know, and this also gets at kind of the, what I was mentioning, that we, we want to invest in individuals and, and leaders, and part of it depends on who you are and why, why you're passionate about this. Um, so, yeah, and that's, and that makes it more compelling, too. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a relationship, right? Going back to, to some of the other points I made. Um, all right, a couple other things we look at. So I mentioned a little bit, so there needs to be a strong and thoughtful plan. It doesn't have to be a specific, for, we don't have a, there's not a specific format to put it in, specific length to explain it, but I, um, I need to know like how, coming from the starting point to where you wanna go, how are you gonna get there? Um, what does that look like? How much, you know, do you need funding for that? Uh, not all projects do, um, a lot of them do, um, but we're kind of looking at realistic steps, right? Get me, walk me along the path, help me to understand it clearly. The clearer the better and easier to understand the better. That actually makes for a, an e easier way to, to come to a decision and, and really, I think we spend, when, we, when we're talking to, to potential grantees, we spend so much time just trying to understand things. And give me clarity on how are we getting there? What, what does that process look like? Um, so other things like how, how long does it take? Uh, realistically, what, how long does it take? What are the financial projections? Um, call out, you know, every project has risks. Um, you need to call out your risks because uh, I'll have to identify those for on our side before making any sort of an investment. Um, what are those risks? Uh, what is it, what, what, what could potentially go wrong, right? What, what are the, um, where, are the, where are the thorns in the process along this path and help us identify those? Because hopefully that's something along the way that we can really um, help mitigate, you know? Um, you know, what is, and there's other questions too. What, is it, some of these are, you know, what, what, what sort of um, contingencies do you have in plan? Do you have, do you have, do you have a cushion of, of something, say something takes twice as long as you expected? What are you going to do then? How, how do, you, do you have? Um, is there a cushion in your in your budget? Is there some assumptions that you're 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 making that? What if those assumptions are wrong? Like I mentioned with that that nonprofit in Chicago, um, so it just helps to 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 know that there's you've been thinking about this, right? Anytime we make an investment, there's there's a we want to know that you've, you've been thinking through what. Not everything's going to go perfectly well every time. So how do you how do you how do you plan for that? Um, the other thing this this might not be apparently obvious is is. Um, especially individual donors, one of the big questions that we're looking at is who else is involved? So when you, when, when we talk to others about funding, we say, okay, you know, who, who's on your board? Um, who else has already decided to fund you? Because at the end of the day, we're kind of, it's kind of a, a group that's supporting you. And we want to, we want to know who else is part of that, that, that group, because we're going to inevitably end up talking to each other and just, just assume right, right now, all your funders are going to talk to each other. Um, not all of them, but this, a lot of them are probably already already partnering on other investments. In this, I mean, the, the Catholic world is 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 small, right? It's when we just talked to John. Johnny mentioned that it's a small world, uh, and, and who knows who? I think it's just. I mean, the, it's it's people are going to know each other. They're going to have backgrounds. So assume your funders are going to talk to each other. Um, but that's also just on the on the flip side. That's a way that you can create value for your supporters. Um, there is a we just invested in a new um, kind of. Uh, uh, intellectual kind of um, it, it's at the university level in Pittsburgh so we're very involved with the Lumen Christi Institute in Chicago it's a Lumen Christi-esque entity in in Pittsburgh um, but there's actually one believe it, there's one donor that we uh, Catholic donor in, in Pittsburgh that we don't know who we'd like to get to know and it turns out they're a funder of this group that we just funded now that's not the reason we supported them but one of the great th things we get out of it is, is, is an introduction um, so think about when, once you have um, you know your supporters and and your investors. Um, that's a great way. That doesn't cost anything to, to make connections and, you know, um, find ways to add value to their investment. Uh, it's not just the product or, or service that you're, you're producing, but it's also uh, hopefully a, a, um, an extra thing that they, they like. The, the, uh, funders are, it's, it can actually be somewhat lonely uh, 
when they're very successful financially because they're going to want to spend time with their peers and their peer group the more they earn the smaller that peer group gets um there's been a lot of written about it's kind of lonely lonely at the top it's it's I don't, maybe maybe not but it's um but the, you know it, more and more they want to, you know couples want to meet other couples who are interested in the same topics and same catholic groups uh the family i, I work for um they're also um you know they're chairing a couple boards they're actually chairing the, there's a uh, search or, um sorry, capital campaign right now for Focus, Fellowship of Catholic University Students, and they're co-chairing that campaign. It's not public yet. They're, they're in the private phase, I, I think, still. Um, but they're, they're always, you know, they've met a lot of other couples through that, and they love that. Um, and so that's a huge value add that Focus has given them. Um, and now they've, you know, they see each other at, well, when they travel at other, other, other events and uh, love having those relationships. So, um, so think about, you know, between your board, your funders, other 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 you know partners and, and friends that you guys are working with um how you can add value to your to your funders that's it's actually a big a big thing um uh, a couple other things uh one other thing that we like to do and uh, most funders like to do this too is we like to figure out ways to add value to our, our other grantees um so i i frequently in the last couple of weeks i've made introductions between a couple of our grantees or between people that for a variety of reasons we didn't we weren't able to support them financially at least not right now but we were able to say hey but you know I, i've got three other people you should talk to um, and I'm sorry we can't support you right now, but uh, I think you'll like talking to these people. And by the way, I also know a couple other donors, and we'll we'll eventually make introductions there because I think they might like like to know you. So getting to know people and, and kind of breaking the ice and having those those initial conversations and, and making friendships uh, can be really helpful. <clears throat> um, so look for ways for for donors to help um, you make make add value to their other grantees. Um, a couple other things. This is kind of in the other category uh, that that we look for. Uh, so likelihood of success, uh, are there clear deliverables? Uh, do we know what's, what's actually, what we're, what we're going to, are we going to get reports quarterly, twice a year? Uh, maybe for us, we, we actually prefer phone calls um, and just to kind of go over how things are going. Um, we, we do look at the, at the board. How is your board set up? Uh, do, you have, do you have a board? Uh, who's, who's on it? What, what, how often are you talking to them? Uh, good governance goes a long way, for, especially for a startup. Uh, who, who, you, who you've surrounded yourself with really matters. Um, we're also, one of the things we do is we usually try to limit ourselves to a certain percentage of an organization's budget. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's more, we're willing to go higher for a startup if something's new. Um, but once an organization is established, we actually try to stay below 10%. That's kind of our, our area of comfort, I would say. So, um, so knowing that you, you, you have to have kind of a wider array of support from other, other sources. Um, one of the things we always look for is, is scale. Is, is there a way that, that you know, startup phase is there's, there's usually a bigger investment up front, um, but there has to be for us, we have to see a path to scale. Or is this, you know, once you get up and running, is that going to make you able to find other supporters more readily, get other sources of income faster? Uh, it's maybe a lot, a lot of small gifts, for instance. Um, we're always going to look for that. And we also look for an exit. Um, rarely do we want to be supporting any organization at the same level in perpetuity. We tend to like, higher initial investments and then back off and then eventually back out. Um, but we like getting things started. We like helping, you know, I mean, that's, that kind of speaks to the, uh, my, my family's, uh, the, the funders, uh, equity background. That Andrew, still tends to be what they do. Yeah, John. Jump in with a definition. When you say exit, you're actually talking about your own, you're not talking about the exit that the company wants to take in a, in a startup manner. You're meaning how do you stop funding? Is that, am I understanding you? That's, word exit right yeah, now? that's right. Um, yeah, like right now, I mean, we're, we're, I, I'm always looking at, you know, how much, how much are we uh, spending per year in, in grants? Um, and w for us to be able to do new, help new groups start up, we have to be able to slow down the pace of some of the other groups that we're supporting. So it's, it's a bit of a cycle in how that works. Yeah, so the exit would be, usually it's, it's, a, it's a ramp down. It's never just, almost never is it just a total cutoff. Um, but we, unless there's some sort of, you know, major integrity issue or, or something like that. But um, so that, yeah, that is how we think about it. Um, so let me, um, do you want me, Johnny, let me get into like how to approach donors and how to do that with that. I know we're at the 1230 mark. Yeah, so. the, no, I, th I think that would be helpful. <clears throat> but I, I want to give people a moment too. Were there any specific things that were mentioned that you guys want to dig into? Because otherwise we will get into that topic that Anthony just referenced, which is how to find them. Oh, we're starting to see questions coming in. Okay. Um, 
So Karina, I have you first up. Karina, do you mind just jumping in, going on mute? Sorry, they're playing Wii behind me, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, but <laughs> I have been getting advice from a lot of people because I don't understand the business world. So all of these things are really new to me. So my question is, I've been told to get a nonprofit started with the smallest board possible. If I can get it in Delaware where it's just myself and my husband, do that so you can get started, start rolling a little bit and then add boards strategically with who actually is needed. So is that a bad idea? Because I know you kept saying like, it matters who's behind you. It matters if your board is good because we want to be on boards with other high name people. So should I be trying to get a board right off the bat and starting with eight people that are strong? Or is it better to just start with me, my husband and one cousin and go from there no i th think you're getting good advice um yeah if, as a startup start small uh usually you want you know an odd number um so three is a good way to start just to get your papers you know, your paperwork um going um it's, it's a sign of a mature organization that it becomes a little bit bigger i, I think there is there is such a thing even for a mature organization that there, there you know too there is too big that most boards are we see are way too big they're, you know you hit like you get into the 20 30 people and it's like whoa i don't even know how you how you manage that uh, but as a startup, yeah, pr I mean, probably three people is good. And you can start with whoever, you know, is willing to be that initial board. But, but pretty soon you'd want to get um, people who can really add value, who are not just kind of a, a name uh, that's just to get the paperwork through, but um, somebody who's who's providing you really good advice and, and value and who's going to be able to be that support for you and a coach for you and kind of play that, that real board role. Are donors less likely to give before that point, like before you have those other board members on? No, because I think well, as, um, different donors are going to have different tolerances for startups. Um, the, the thing is, you have to look for if someone doesn't have, if they haven't done startups before, um, you need to look for proxies for um, an indication of whether something is going to be successful, whether this person is going to be you know, a good leader and worth investing in. Um, so that, that's you got to find that whatever the proxy is um, somehow somewhere. But no, I, there's a certain expectations. If it's a startup, it's not you know it's going to be you know bootstrapped. There's going to be only a you know the board's not going to be big. There's not going to be a lot of you know background and history and track record. So um, that's not a red flag. It's just a sign that you're you're young and you're just getting going. So but to the extent you can find other other kind of positives and and um, you know, other things, other people that have, have bought in and are supportive of you, that's, that's helpful. So it's, yeah, startups are, are messy and that's to be expected. Okay, All right, thank you. Jessica, you asked next question. Just uh, start off by saying who you are, what you're working on, and then jump into the question. Okay, for sure. Um, I'll start my camera here. Hi. Um, Hi, Jessica. Hello, uh, my name is Jessica. I'm working with Martin um, on starting these houses of discernment here in San Francisco and, and hopefully in, in cities elsewhere. Um, so thank you for pulling back the curtain. I wanted to say it, it, it definitely helps to clarify, you know, what's going on behind the scenes and I'm learning a lot. I have two specific questions uh, based on what you shared in this first half. Um, so the first, in grant selection, you mentioned uh, considerations like likability and competency. That's what grantors are, are looking at and for. Um, I was curious about the role of uh, unconscious bias in the selection and I know that maybe the term bias it, depending on where you're coming from might be a loaded term. Uh, when I use it, you know, it's it's something that I'm aware we all have. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing. But I, I do, I am curious about how you recommend grantees navigate this while still being true to themselves. Um, because it's, I think, one thing to be, you know, who you are and likable because of it versus I would really like funding. You know, this grantor seems to really like this sort of factor or person or or whatever. And then um, balancing that. So that was my first question. Um, let me make sure I under understand. Well, I, so I would say this, I mean, likability, I should probably define that. Um, when, when I, for, for us, it's, you know, do we want to, is this someone we want to, we want to work with, right? Is it, can, can we see ourselves collaborating? Uh, can we see ourselves, um, is, is it, is it going to be a, a successful partnership? Um, is, is what we look for. So, th I, I, th you know, the biggest thing we look for is, is, um, is I mean, the, the competence. Is, do, do we think this person has, can pull this off, right? Is there, like I mentioned before, the, there's proxies. Is, is there a, is there, through any number of means, is there a, um, th is either through your previous organizations they've run, leadership that they've, uh, that they've had in other roles, um, 
for us, I mean, we're looking, it's, you know, that, that's, that's kind of the, and there's a number of ways to get to that. Um, that's kind of what we look for is, is it, is it likely to succeed? It's for us, it's, it's you know, back, different backgrounds and coming from, um, you know, diverse set of experiences. That's a positive. That's a huge positive. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I, I, I don't know how to, I'm not even sure how to answer your, your question otherwise on if there's, if there's some sort of a, you know, a bias or, I mean, for us, the, the number one thing is, is, is it, is the person capable of doing um, kind of uh, what they're, what they're setting out to do, I guess. Okay. Um, so really, uh, usually it's kind of your know, professional uh, you know, background and ability and is this person passionate and they, is a, it's certain on, on the Catholic side, right? Is, is this, is this a, a lot of these are going to be passion projects. So these aren't going to be, um, by and large, they're not going to be financially super, you know, lucrative. Um, I mean, I hope, I hope you all are, you know, I, I hope you're all incredibly successful and that you get lots of investors. Um, so, if, but, but you know, inevitably a lot of these are going to be passion projects. So we, we look for passion and is this a, you know, um, are, are they bringing their faith into this? Or are they bringing, um, you know, a unique background that is, is going to lead them to success? So, um, I don't, I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure, I mean, that's just how, how we tend to think about it, but. Okay. Yeah. I, I think um, for the, the term likability and competency seem more like arbitrary terms. And I'm just guessing if there was more structure behind, because um, it can mean different things to different people, at least uh, sure. when I heard those terms. So I wanted to understand, mm-hmm. uh, you know, yeah, uh, it more concretely. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm but, sorry if it's still vague, but that's, I guess I'm trying to, I'm trying to give you as much information as I can. Okay. And then the second question, uh, so you, you mentioned that it's recommended to look for donors who are open to getting their hands dirty and uh, you know, build a partnership. Uh, and that includes having a place on boards. Um, how do you recommend balancing accepting investor involvement in that capacity with control over your project, maintaining those boundaries and as well as being open to the collaboration? Um, you know, I think it, th- there's a lot of things you can do. It's it, a lot of it's, it's, you know, you're, you're not just going to have investors on your board, for instance, there's gonna be multiple board members. Um, mm-hmm. so ideally your board would have content experts, um, people that are, are, have, have, you know, so, some level of experience in your field. Um, and there should be in a lot of boards, you know, there's, you should go to like board source and some of those organizations, there's going to be people recommend having someone who knows accounting and who knows finance and knows kind of all these, you know, there should be someone who knows who, who has a legal perspective. Um, and there's going to be different kind of, you know, uh, opinions on that, depending on the size your and age of your organization and what you're trying to do. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you should, you should have a frank conversation and say, Hey, what is, we'd love to have you on our board. Um, how much involvement or control do you want? Um, here's what, and just be clear. I, I want, I want advice. I want, I want your feedback. Um, there's a lot of people that are on the board are, are going to give us feedback. And at the end of the day that, you know, I'm, it's, I'm starting this up and I, I'm, I want you because I'm, I'm, you know, um, we lo- love to have your financial support and love to have your advice. And I just be upfront with them. Um, I mean, usually I, I don't, I haven't at least interacted with donors who are going to want total control. That's not why they're involved. They, they, they want to, you know, they, they, they agree with the mission and the vision and they want you to be successful. So I think because they're putting money into, into, into it, they just want to be able to have a closer, uh, have, have closer tabs uh, and, and know what's going on and, and, and been help. I mean, that's what the thing, the main thing we're looking for is, is to be able to help the organization be successful. So that's how we think about it at least. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Anna, why don't you take next question and then we'll go back to the topic, Anthony, that you brought up. Anthony or Anna, can you go? Yep. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Anthony. Uh, hi, so, Anna. Uh, we found, so we're a couple years old and we found that um, some Catholic grant awarding organizations use the National Catholic Directory as kind of like a litmus test or even just a gatekeeper mm-hmm. to the application process at all. Um, and we have a separate 501c3 status, so going for an asterisk listing is a bit more complicated and we're working on it. Um, but I guess we're wondering, have you found that to be a common practice? Um, and also, too, if a positive relationship exists with a foundation and the applying organization, you know, has a solid advisory council or board, have you found that to be enough to start the application process? I guess, what's your experience with that relationship between Catholic organizations or Catholic foundations, the National Catholic Directory, and organizations that are working on it, but maybe not quite there yet? Uh, so we don't use the, the National Catholic Directory, uh, in part because there's, there's some steps involved and it's, 
um, I mean, our, our big focus is, you know, what, what is an organization's mission? What are they trying to accomplish? Um, you know, usually you can, you can compensate. If you're not in the directory, you can compensate by, um, by, by who you're surrounding yourself with, right? Who's on your board, who your advisors. Um, usually you should, if you have, especially some ecclesial advisors, that, that's, that's really helpful. And that kind of, that sends a signal of, of what you're trying to accomplish and, and um, that you're serious about, you know, being strongly, you know, Catholic and having, you know, being on, on the up and up in terms of what you're, you're accomplishing to, to evangelize or kind of however it fits with your mission. Um, there are some foundations that, that rely, they're only going to give to groups in the Catholic directory. I don't think there's a lot though. I mean, um, there's, so I have a lot of, a number of friends who, who run the organization called FATICA, Foundations and Donors Interested in Catholic Activities. Those, most of the, the foundations and, and funders there are almost, um, they're, they're only given to Catholic causes. Um, and I think, the last time I heard some, it's, it's, I was talking to some funders there that had that requirement. So usually that's, that's a, that's kind of a sign of, um, uh, I mean, they have that, they have that there for a reason, but that's more of a kind of a, a process sign off, right? They, they want, they want to only give to, to groups that are, that are kind of, you know, that, um, I'm mean, not even sure how to, you know, articulate kind of the, the rationale for that. But, um, I, I think as long as you have, I mean, from our perspective, and a lot of the individual, most individual donors, I don't think would um, would look at the, the Catholic directory. So, um, as long as the mission is is solid, what the work you work is solid, and who you're surrounding yourself is solid, I think that's that's what we look for. Thanks. Yeah. All right, Anthony. I think that's good for the questions that have come in. You want to talk a little bit about finding? Yeah, kind of finding and approaching. Um, so, so one of the this is again, this is kind of in no particular order. Um, it helps to you know learn about your donors uh, and who you're who you're looking at. So a lot of people will, in the, doing the kind of the prospecting work, um, looking at uh, boards and funders of other similar organizations or who've done something in kind of the same sector that you have. Uh, but learn about who's who you're interested in. Take interest. Um, it always it, it's always I mean, it's, it might sound kind of um, basic, but we love it when someone says, "Hey, I, I saw you were involved with that other project, and we really like that, and we we really admire you know uh, Focus or Bishop Aaron or." Um, you know, so, some, some other entity, you know, uh, uh, the Aquinas 101 videos, that's something that we help seed. Um, and they're like, yeah, I really, that's really neat. I saw that you're involved with that. Um, I'd like to learn, uh, we're doing something similar, but I'd love to get, you know, get your advice or get your thoughts and can you, can I get some feedback on something I'm thinking about? Um, you know, so take an interest in, in what a donor is doing and maybe their background, um, or some other interest. That's always really, really helpful. Um. Um, so find, the other thing I would say is always try to find a point of commonality. Uh, so, you know, I know, you know, getting an introduction. So I met Edward yesterday. It was an introduction through OSV. Uh, I've gotten introductions through John. Uh, talked to John Cannon uh, because of an introduction. Um, you know, look for, for friends that know people who have a, there's a certain donor you want to, you want to know or someone you want to meet. Uh, it always helps. Introductions are a great way because that's someone else kind of vouching for, hey, this guy's doing something really, really interesting. You should talk to him um, and just hear him out. Um, or, or saying, hey, I, I saw that you've, you've supported these organizations. I wanted to know if you've, um, what, what your rationale is for that and then kind of see what you've learned in the process. Um, always looking for some sort of a, a reason um, to, to, to reach out and to, to see where there's uh, some point of commonality, right? So find that point of commonality. Um, so, so things, uh, um, a couple of, a couple of warning, warning points though. Um, so, so be careful about coming across as, as single-minded. I mentioned earlier that we look for relationships and we want to, you know, look for, for common friends and look for connections. Um, you know, this, believe it or not, we still get a lot of, you know, very single-minded in the first conversation, they're asking for, for funding a specific thing at a certain level. And it's like, whoa, it's slow, slow down. You know, we're, we're trying to, we're just trying to get to know each other and you're already like, you know, uh, it's. It's like Dave to ask for for uh, engagement on the first first date or something. It's um, I'm I'm still surprised at how fast some people try to move, um, and we we never make decisions after a first conversation. We never um, you know we always want to get to know someone and take you know get to know them and it's, you know several inter interactions and several different hopefully settings is something that we always look for. Um, so the other thing I we always joke I, this is other people that work in kind of philanthropy. Um, I always joke about this, but you know inevitably as soon as you're on the funding side. Your jokes get funnier. Um, apparently, I'm not as bald as I thought I was. Uh, uh, my insights are so insightful, and that's such a good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, so, so we get it. Um, you know, people want to put their best foot forward when asking for funding. Um, and we also, I mean, I've been in, in the, the sector long enough to know that that a lot of times prospective grantees will tell you exactly what they think you want to hear. 
Um, but basically going back to some of the stuff I said earlier, it's, you know, we actually want candor and, and honesty and, and, you know, um, you know, good assessment about what's, what's, you know, what might be tough or tricky. Um, and, and not just total honest, you know, positivity the whole time. Um, like it's a sales pitch. So, um, so be careful about flattery, I think, um, and realize that we're, we're all people and we, we're all trying to, to, we have the same goals. We're all trying to, um, in this case, evangelize and come up with really good Catholic programs that can, um, you know, advance the church and the gospel. So um, and here's some other stuff that's a turnoff. Sorry, this is kind of funny doing. Um, uh, so there's, there's, there are, there's, we have one friend, a priest, uh, who's, who just pitches every time he sees you. He's like a, a nonstop pitch uh, salesman. He's, he's wondering, he's doing great work, but he's, um, I, I, first time I met him was at the, I went to the Napa conference a couple of years ago and, and he didn't know who I was. And he just started pitching me first. I hadn't even talked to him for, for five minutes and he was already trying to pitch me. I'm like, well, big turnoff. Um, other things just kind of, this, that we, sometimes people have said, oh, we are perfect for you. We are the thing that you've been looking for. And it's like this expectation of support. I'm like, how do you know that? Um, we don't even know each other yet. Um, uh, I would say also it's treating, sometimes people see, would see me as like a gatekeeper is kind of like this necessary like person to get through in order to get to the family. Um, like it's treating staff or uh, advisors as kind of like functionaries just on the, on the way to the principal. Um, that, that can, that can be problematic. Um, also, um, you know, like, like acting like, you know, best friends without knowing each other. Um, I'll, I'll give you, this is, I got this, um, quick, kind of cold calls with back to the point about looking for a connection. Um, I got this, this is a LinkedIn invitation I got recently, um, without connect, it was, it was just a real turn off. Uh, um, it's just, it, it could have been better, right? It'd be great to, and this is, I'm just reading from this LinkedIn invitation that I got. Uh, it'd be great to connect so that we can work together to spread the good news of Jesus. Thank you for your consideration. Um, not like a, Hey, I saw you're doing this and I'm interested. Can I learn more? Um, and I, we don't know each other yet and just kind of calling it out and saying, let's, you know, can I, can I hear what you, this sounds really interesting. Can I, can I hear what you, I'd like to tell you what I'm doing. Um, it's just, I don't know, realize that, you know, it's, it's people and we want to, um, you know, hopefully get us to get to know people, uh, build, build relationships. Um, let me, let me stop there. I know we're, we're coming to the end. Um, I've got some, uh, I also have ideas on kind of once, once you're funded, just ideas you can, you can follow there. But um, let me stop there. You guys, I saw some questions coming through. Sure. I think Jessica, you, <coughs> I saw yours come through and there might've been an, I only saw Jessica. So Jessica, why don't you go? And if anybody else has more, just feel free to go off mute. Sorry for uh, all these questions. Um, I, I was oh. just curious, Anthony, like you, you said that uh, grantors appreciate candor. Uh, I was wondering what what happens when when the candor or honesty gets really uncomfortable. Um, you know, is is yes, candor. Are there other factors to keep in mind? I'm just curious about the discomfort that often comes with with that sort of honesty. Um, I think as as long as candor and charity go together, I think mm -hmm. it's um, it's good. I mean, so I mean, I'll give you a couple examples. It's like I've had um, grantees say, you know, be like, hey, like I'm. I'm really look, looking forward to working with you, but you guys are taking longer than I, than I expected. What can we do about that? Uh, and I really respected that. I mean, sometimes things do take long because I'm working around, um, you know, because we're, I'm one person staffing you know, hundred grantees and um, the families, you know, they still have day jobs and lives and stuff. So there's a lot to, it can, it can take longer than, than you want. Um, so I, you know, that's, I'm, I'm actually really grateful for that. I want to know how people are, you know, what their perspectives are, you know, along the process. Um, but yeah, and, and, and part of it's, you know, just, uh, I think it maybe another way to put it, it's, it's, it's um, we look for kind of self-awareness um, and, and kind of where something is strong and where something needs work. Um, and people have called us out on, on being better. Um, and that's, people, that's what takes a lot of courage to do that. And I'm, I'm actually, I see that as a positive. Um, so I, I, I don't mind it as long as I think as, as long as it's in charity and it's, and it's, it's, it's honest. So um you know, that's, that's us. I mean, not every funder is going to be in that position, but I think just, yeah, I, I, I'd say moving away from just all, you know, um, you know, roses and, you know, everything is just perfectly wonderful all the time. I, I think, you know, knowing if, if a long term, longer term relationship working with someone is going to require um, just a little bit more, um, you know, honesty about where things are, are going well and where they're not. So thank you. Sure.
All right, anyone else? I have some questions, if that's okay. Um, yeah, maybe you could just tell some, you know, it's just a great overview of, you know, kind of process and um, lessons learned and analytical frameworks. Maybe would you mind sharing any other, any stories of how, like other stories of how you've seen it done well in terms of your relationship, you know, things that kind of can help kind of be models as, as we think about like growing and in, in our entrepreneurial endeavors in a, in a way that's respectful and good. Do you, John, thanks for the question. Do you mean more um, kind of personally as an entrepreneur uh, growth or are you uh, talking about kind of like, you know, examples of meeting other, you know, getting connections to other funders? Can you be more specific? Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, not very clear question, kind of big. Um, like, yeah, you, you know, working with 100 grantees now and you've just seen a lot, like, I guess in terms of ones that you've seen, um, you know, you invested them, you know, kind of thinking about some profile of people here that you may have invested them early um, and how they, maybe if there are any stories that stand out of how of ones that navigated that early growth well and what that looked like. And, um, yeah. Sure. Let me, um, I'm just pulling up my list here. Um, so a couple that were really successful. So one is, uh, I mentioned if you guys have heard of the Thomistic Institute, um, out of Washington, uh, they're based out of DC. They're the, based in the Dominican House of Studies, originally founded by, uh, Father Thomas Joseph White. He's now at the Angelicum in Rome. Um, but they, they, they have this, this, this federal society like model, um, providing, you know, courses at, or, or chapters at, uh, uh, starting with kind of like Ivy League college campuses where they bring in strong Catholic speakers. Um, but they started very modestly a number of years ago, um, and have, have really, I mean, they're, they're, they don't, they're not meeting their demand because they, they can't grow fast enough right now. Um, and they also realized that they made a really important pivot, um, when the pandemic hit, they, they put a lot of extra, you know, money that they were going to put into, you know, campus events and that kind of a thing. They started that they did the, um, I think they called the quarantine lectures and they bought, they built this whole studio in their, in their offices in, in DC. Um, and it's been incredible. This the, the rate at which they're, they're getting uptick, um, your views has been really impressive. And then they started this Aquinas 101 uh, video course, which is, if you guys have signed up for those, uh, please do. They're incredible. Um, on kind of the thought of St. Thomas. So that's, that's one example we've been, and they're just, the work that they're able to do is just incredibly uh, affordable. Uh, just, just very, um, very strong. Uh, I mentioned the, the scholarship tax credit program in, in Illinois. That's more of a policy win that's generated. Um, it generates up to hundred million dollars of uh, scholarship money for, for tax, uh, through this, this mechanism for, for kids to go to Catholic schools or, or any private schools in Illinois. Um, that's been incredibly successful. Um, sorry, I'm just looking through my list uh, just to see what else uh, jumps out right now um some of these are just on, on different different topics forgive me for uh you know bishop Barron was was one of the good ones i mentioned that we were one of the first investors in the catholicism series um, um i mean uh, i'll give you an example actually so, someone um so I'm going to look at there's a, there's a one we just did and it's because of a relationship uh, we had that goes dates back a few years. There's an Australian priest named Father Rob Gallia, um, who was he was on the Australian X Factor uh, years ago. Uh, he's he's really good at reaching uh, teenagers, um, very much kind of focused on the kerygma. Um In Australia, you know, surprisingly, it's even it's even more more of a secular culture than it is here in the U.S. Um, but he has he's very good at just kind of basic big life questions. Uh, if you search him, you'll, he has a, he's just started a ministry, FRG Ministries International. Um, and so we're an, an early investor in helping him. He's got actually a good business model, has incredible like social media followers. Um, that's, so that's an ongoing bet for us. Um, there's a lot of, you know, if you look at, there's a lot of risks with him um, just because, you know, there's not the same idea of philanthropy uh, in, in, the, in Australia. It's everything, you know, even Catholic schools are funded by the state there. Um, so, uh, but he's, he's one. So that's just an example of an ongoing one. Um, but we think he's going to be successful. He used to, his, his issue as an entrepreneur was that he's very creative, but he, in order to fund his work, he had to take all these speaking engagements all over the world. So he was traveling so much that he was, he went, he didn't have the energy to, to do his creative work, which is a problem. Um, so he came to us for, for support. So we're giving him some startup support. Um, and it's possible there's a silver lining to the pandemic for him because he's, he has all kinds of time now, and, and as you know, on, a, on an average Sunday for um, for Mass, he'll have ten thousand viewers. So, 
Um, but that's that's just an example of, of, of one other one that's uh, that we're working on right now. Mark Sorry, when we see when, when we see each, each other in person, I'll, I promise I'll have another another example maybe that I can go into more depth on. Um, I'm going to do a time check. So we got three more minutes. Martin, you got next, and I saw Karina and Edward are asking questions as well. But um, just we'll I'll, I'll check time if it runs over. So Martin, why don't you go? Sure. Uh, before I ask my question, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, to, uh, um, to 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 your whole team and to your donors for uh, for supporting Bishop Robert Barron from the beginning. I, I didn't know that you guys were involved with them because uh, he's had not just a huge impact on me and Harbor, but I'm sure many other people in this room. So thank you very much for that. Um, the second, uh, so my question actually is, is kind of strange. Um, I, I, because I'm really intrigued by everything you said about like the, the mentorship component and like being in, wanting to be involved in the projects. I was just wondering if you could give an example of something with one of um, your, your um, benef uh, benefactees that went really, really poorly or, or maybe almost went really poorly, a big mistake that was made or could have been made and, 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 and how uh, um, uh, the donors were able to, to help turn that around in the other direction through their advice. Uh, sorry, it's kind of a strange question. So, so it, it, advice that, or something was going wrong and advice um, and kind of guidance was able to turn it around? Is, yes, that, is that the question? Yes, sir. That's a good question. Nothing is immediately jumping out. Um, sorry, I'm just looking through my list to see if any, any stories, any ideas pop up. Let me think on that if that's okay. okay. Um, well, I, I'll give you one example. Uh, actually, so so we there's a there's a um, this is so this is kind of out of this this topic range. There's a uh, a home for um, domestic violence in Chicago that we support, um, and the, the family's had a background there. They've funded stuff in the past, really loved it. But but um, a couple of years ago when I first met them, they it was poorly run. It was mismanaged. We love the mission of it though. It had a, it's, it's Catholic roots. It was run by I forget which sisters ran it, and they had a mission to really provide for women and, and children who've been through domestic violence to give them like a restart and ability to like get back on their feet. Uh, and the mission is beautiful and it's, it's central to our faith and it's, it's what we need to be doing being the, the hands and feet of Christ um, practically in person, you know? Um, but the place was so poorly run and they're still the, the they're, and we're still involved with them. They have a good leader now, but even like the bureaucracy of, of being connected, they're connected to Catholic charities. Um, and it's, you know, so I'm, I was on the phone call yesterday trying to, you know, give advice to them. And it's, um, I, you know, initially they weren't, the past leadership wasn't even open to advice. And now there's, there's leadership that is, but it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing. It's, it's taking a ton of time, actually. Um, but we're so committed to it. And it's so important. They play such an important role that that's one we're not going to walk away from. But um, sorry, I don't have any more specifics. And some of those, are, yeah, some of those are, are, there's some sensitive details with, with that place. But um it, it, I, it's a situation where I think good, good advice and good connections have, have proved fruitful. So, um, thank you very much. Sure. All right, Anthony, we're at one. So, um, thank you so much for your time for doing this. And I know we're all looking forward to see you in person and hopefully I can get lunch with you earlier than that. But um, absolutely. This is, this has been really, really great. If we have other sporadic questions, is that something we can forward to you and get into? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, let me know how I, how I can help. I mean, the, the thing I didn't say is, you know, when I was at the round table, a lot of my, my time was um, fielding, you know, questions from um, other nonprofits and startups, mostly in the education sector, but um, people that are just looking for advice. So I'm, you know, I, I'll, I'll help however I can. So um, please, please feel free to, to call on me. Perfect. Thank you, Anthony. Um, Thanks, guys. All right. For everyone else, I'll stay on if we want to do a quick recap. Sean, I had an idea for you, if you don't mind staying on just for another minute um, as well. I just had a question for you. All right. Anthony, we'll excuse you. and then we All right. Agree. Thanks, guys. God bless you. Looking forward to seeing you in person. Cheers. All right. Have a good weekend. Um, Sean, the way you described uh, Eche and just talking about the real estate, like you just used real estate and that just made a connection in my head that I hadn't conceived of oh, yeah. before. Oh, um, yeah. We, like Martin has been talking to the Fitzgerald Institute for Real Estate on campus. And have you gotten connected with them at all? 
I know you you talked to the Leo, the Lab for Economic Opportunity, but um, no, I don't. I don't. That's not ringing a bell. I don't believe that um, TJ or Dave have, have mentioned that either in, in your in y'all's group. Uh, so very, yeah, very interested to uh, learn about them. Martin, do you mind just describing a little bit about the conversations you've had uh, with that group and just 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 describe a little bit of it and share it for Sean. Sure. Um, I, I gave, uh, uh, you were asking about fire, right? Yeah. Fitzgerald. Yep. Um, so, um, yeah, it was, it was really cool. I've been talking to, to Dan Kelly and, uh, I basically, you know, he was asked, you know, he, he was basically asking, it's like, well, what do you, what do you guys need? And, uh, and I gave him basically two asks that kind of got contracted into one ask, uh, based on later decisions, but basically we're looking for real estate partners to help us to, to scale this, um, at other places. And, um, and they, and, you know, Dan was like kind of excited about this. Oh yeah, that should be no problem. Um, and the other thing is like one, one, uh, we have a big hole in my board. We have a lawyer, but we don't have a lawyer who's like had knows anything about real estate. Um, so we're hoping that, you know, this isn't something that we're expecting them to be able to provide you know, right away, but we want to start um, having relationships with these guys and hopefully be able to bring somebody to be in uh, uh, more involved in Harbor in the capacity of a, of a board member. And, and Martin, you've been dubbed a, a fire fellow. And so you're on the <laughs> fire <laughs> well, right? That, that's right. That's right. And um, that was, uh, no, just a really, really kind thing um, for them, for them to do. Uh, so uh, basically, I, I guess they're trying to to show our work on on their website and within their networks as like a case study on an organization that's trying to uh, help leverage church property towards mission oriented um, uh, projects. Um, so, um, so that yeah, that that's that's what the with the with the uh, affiliate is the term that we're using. Got it. So, um, so Sean, you and I can yeah, talk. Yeah offline on that, but uh, Martin's coach is Michael Sherl, who's an advisor for the Fitzgerald. When I say Fitzgerald, that's the acronym for FIRE. And oh, okay. he might be a really easy person just because he's been involved in it so deeply. And that might be a, a influential introduction person to make an introduction. Um, so Sean, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. But I, just the way you described it this time, I was like, oh, maybe this is a case study type application the same way that Martin's thinking about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that sounds uh, very, very synchronous. Um, you know, he's built a whole village, right? Like right. For, for the homeless out there. And it's like, it's not just like something that's pieced together. It's like a master planned. Uh, community yeah so it's very it'd be very intriguing at the very least uh for michael or the Fitzgerald institute to to know about it or yeah and um i also have good connections in the architecture school too so the master planning elements um too so martin same offer for like to you if the architecture school is ever of interest um so just sean what would help me most is just if you connect with me on slack or email and just have something that I can forward to Michael Sherl, who again is Martin's coach, but an advisor for Fitzgerald Institute. And uh, we can figure out how to make the intros probably through that avenue would be the most meaningful. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. All right, so let's just do debriefs. Um, Martin, one or two things you got out of that session. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Might not seem like a big deal, but for me, it was a big deal. Um, the, uh, his frankness and like wanting to see failure. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like in my own interview style, whenever I'm interviewing for a job, they say like, what's your biggest, uh, like, wh wh give me something that you suck at. And I say, I suck at math. And, I, yeah, and it's my way of like deflecting and not having to answer the question. And they usually laugh and they don't dig deeper. But, um, but I never thought of looking at that into like um, a more positive light as he, as he articulated. They, they want to see like what, what, how, what is the mechanism and how you work so we can make sure we're a good fit. So that, yeah. that was really helpful to me. Like a, op a compliment opportunity. All right, Edward, what about you? Um, 
I, um, yeah, I mean, I felt like the, um, just the whole conversation around it was uh, much different than I was expecting. And I had a conversation with him yesterday too, that it was much more um, kind of relationship building as opposed to filling out grant applications and stuff like that. I also, I, I don't think I realized who I was, who he was uh, when I got on the phone yesterday. And so I got off afterwards and I emailed Matt and Jay and I'm like, yeah, I think I screwed that one up because I was, <laughs> It was much more uh, g generic of a of an email or a, a conversation that I was expecting. But I, I kind of, he's just very like direct in what he's saying. So it was very helpful for me because it, like I spent all morning looking at podcast stats. I probably should have been doing work, but um, like I just felt like he was very direct about like, these are the things that you need to do. Um, yeah. So like in refocusing on the need to discover like the problem, you know? Yes. What problem are we solving? Yeah, and I, and I think, Edward, what you were just talking, like, uh, he mentioned to me this morning that he had talked to you yesterday, and so I, I encouraged him. I was like, And he said, I blew it, didn't he? <laughs> he chose <laughs> words, verbatim. <laughs> but, I mean, he, he was even candid with me. He said, like, yeah, it was, it was, a lot of the description was a little bit more esoteric than I was looking for, which is, I'm sure, what he said to you. Um, and I, I encouraged him, I was like, bring that into this conversation, because everyone knows Edward, and that's, it's, it brings it all a little bit more to life. And because otherwise, I feel like a lot of our advice can be too abstract. Like when I just hear the laundry list, I can't mentally conceive it unless I start, I, I interpret stories a lot better than I interpret those things. Um, but I, even the story you just gave of the introduction to him, like Anna was, um, I encouraged Anna as like, look up Altum Fund, because uh, he's going to be coming on when I was talking to her. And and I said, see if they have similar issues. But Altum Fund, I don't know where the website is, actually. Like, I was looking for it, and she couldn't find it. So he mentioned that all of this is a relationship game. Um, and Edward, what you're pointing out is as much intel that you can gather, like, prior to a conversation, because who knows who these people are. Um, in a certain way, they're kind of cloaked from us in a lot of conversations. Maybe sometimes that's helpful, but as much intel as you can gather beforehand is probably really good to make those relationship connections as easy as possible. Um, but no, Edward, I wouldn't also, um, my impression too is didn't blow it. I feel like you, you're gonna be able to engage with him specifically a few times and they seem, I, I feel like you all you show is just trajectory. Like, look, I respond, I'm coachable. I think today in this session, he mentioned humble and coachability as qualities that they're looking for. So I think responsiveness means almost more responsiveness and improvement sometimes can mean more than look at the first cool thing that I showed you. Um, all right, John, what about you? Any big points you got out of it? Um, yeah, I thought that when he went through that list of here's what we look for, I thought that was, that was super helpful and yep. interesting. The first thing was, you know, is the leadership and leadership capabilities, but a lot of other stuff that's a pretty rigorous you know, they apply their private equity experience for how yeah. they evaluate deals. So that's, that's, uh, you know, take that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Karina. So for me, it was interesting how they want candor and how really making yourself seem like yourself. Because there are a lot of times even that I've spoken with people and he said like, you you laugh harder at his jokes and he's no longer bald. Like that kind of happens a little bit if you're trying to impress someone. So trying to make sure like, all right, I still have the noise behind me and things are still happening because this is who I am. Yeah. But just making sure that it's really real. Um, and then it also struck me that they look for humility um, because usually people, when I'm talking to them about any of this, they want like, hey, so tell me more about you. And it seems to be a lot of like, me, 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 me. Right. So making sure that it's staying humble, but showing that like I have the integrity and the ability to do it. Um, and then he also said to make sure you have a strong and thoughtful plan, one that's realistic with clear steps. So it's like not just a good plan, but you've thought through it. And it makes sense yeah. for the church, not just for gathering a donor like a pitch. So that was interesting to me, like making it fit into Catholic society, not just the family he works for that has a lot of money and kind of tailoring it to them precisely right. as a pitch. So that was interesting. 
Sean, what about you? What's one or two things you got out of it? Oh, I think just broadly reiterating what you guys are saying, you know, like just reminding us, like it was very helpful just to, to remind us um, that that these investors and donors are, are human, right? And and so so seeking candor, humility, uh, you know, being being uh, you know not receiving sort of uh, a but you know buttoned up sort of presentation, uh, you know that's not what they're necessarily seeking. They're they're looking for for uh, and and that they have a problem solving solving mentality, right? And that's what they're looking in others that it's it's mission based and and it's and uh, like what Karina said, it's gonna it's gonna fill a void. Yep, Eileen. Um, nothing really to add. Just really like seeing all these experts helping all the finalists with on the mission. So yeah, good speaker. Um, Claire, my comment will it'll be about the slots that he talked about. So it was all that word exit that I got confused with initially, where his definition of exit was to show a payment arc and wanting to see it taper off because they essentially have slots that they're funding over time. And they really want to be getting people out of their payment pipeline so they can bring more on. I just thought, I thought that was really interesting because um, that will mean a lot for our members to show financial sustainability and show how you are coming in for a stage where this philanthropy will essentially fund a stage. But it's a little different than equity investment because it, it's kind of like the tranching of equity investment where you don't just get, okay, this is the $1 million raise, but you might be saying, I want three years from you at 100,000 each year or something. It's, it's just a little bit different of an economic model um, than I was familiar with. So I thought that was great. And Claire, I'm just reading yours off to share with everyone else. So you liked how we talked about the specifics of what to talk about during the first conversation so you're coming off too strong in building relationships. There was a piece of advice that I had heard. It was a student who was working with the Under Armour guy like the ceo of under armor and he had this line um i asked him for a piece of wisdom that he learned from him and he said you there's what you're looking for are um people who want to shake your hand not get you to sign a deal and he was talking about these same types of almost sycophantic people that can come in and just immediately say you're wonderful i'm wonderful with you and like kind of jump into marriage without even saying nice to meet you let's go on our first date and so um i thought that was just that that felt real like i bet they come into contact with that type of thing a lot in this quote so all right thank you everyone have a good weekend thank you and sean you just reach out to me and uh we'll we'll get those set up hey we'll john. appreciate it john thanks can, 